Okay, so we have our next speaker here, Dr. Yunus Alila. I'm very excited for his presentation. I had the pleasure of taking one of his courses on forest hydrology a few years ago, and his dedication and passion on this topic has always stuck with me. Um, Dr. Alila graduated from the University of Ottawa with a bachelor degree in civil engineering, a master degree in water resource engineering, and then a doctorate in engineering hydrology. Here at UBC, he teaches and conducts research on climate and land use change effects on water resources. His work over the last 20 years has challenged a century-old hydrologic wisdom on how forests affect large floods. His work has been the subject of much peer-reviewed discussion and generated press releases by the American Geophysical Union. He has also served as an expert witness in three court cases discussing the impacts of logging on hydrology. And he's here today to talk to us about what the hell caused the <laughs> Chilcotin landslide, how forest cover loss has awakened a sleeping giant. So take it away. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> well, thank you, Jennifer and co for uh, the invitation. I'm really happy to be with you this uh, afternoon uh, on a very nice day out there. Uh, before we start, I wanted to uh, make a disclaimer Non-mainstream scientists have always been called a lot of names because they disagree with the status quo, with mainstream wisdom. And therefore, I just wanted to make sure my audience understand the only thing that drives me and motivates me is to actually um, reduce risk and reliability to professionals when they are advising clients and the, the, the industry and the government, um, reduce risk and reliability on government, particularly the provincial government, because if they are sued, then the likelihood that they lose and they end up, um, end up, I end up paying for it because I'm a taxpayer's money too. And, um, as a professional as well, what motivates me as a professional engineer registered in the Professional Association of Engineers and Geoscientists in British Columbia, we are mandated by the profession to protect the public. And this is why I have been vocal about the issues in relation to the forest hydrology that have been guiding or misguiding forestry practice in British Columbia. I made a slight change in the title, what in the hell, as opposed to what the hell, which is, I think, uh, uh, more polite. <laughs> a few weeks ago, an article in the Tai came out asking the rhetorical, rhetorical question, are BC's forests running out of trees? And I selected this actually video, which is a two minute video that shows uh, a time lapse of the mostly clear-cut logging um, since 1900. And as you could see in there, um, most of this clear-cut logging ended up being over the last 20 to 30 years. And uh, basically, two-thirds of the forest in British Columbia is now regenerating young forest that cannot be logged for another 60 to 80 years at least in the BC interior. In the northern of BC, it will take over 100 years for that logged forest to be able to be logged again. This is the secondary forest. And uh, moving forward, I'd like you to keep in mind that the science have shown that 10 years of regrowth in the cut blocks, because the industry is mandated to actually replant the trees after they do the clear cut logging, the 10 years regrowth in the cattle block, 20 years, 30 years have dismal, and let me repeat, have dismal hydrologic recovery. The hydrologic functionality of the, f of the region from zero year all the way to 30 years is really dismal, particularly in the interior dry and snow environment of British Columbia. And that is supposed to be worst with the change in climate, making the climate warmer and stuff like that. Uh, as you could see in there, the pie chart shows that uh, two-thirds of the forest 
has been logged and most of which is actually in the late, in, in the last 20, 30 years. So all of that clear cut logging over the last decades, in my opinion, based on the science that I've been doing over the last 20, 30 years, all the landscape in hydrology is now sitting at a very heightened risk to water, risk to hydrology, risk to geomorphology. When I say geomorphology is the stability of the channel network, the landsliding, and, and all of these uh, hydrogeomorphic activities that actually shape the form of the landscape, including the channel network. And I'm going to run through hotspot hot areas in British Columbia that have been subject to excessive clear cutting as examples, illustrating how the landscape in BC is sitting at a very heightened risk to hydrology. And the first one of them is the Kettle River Basin. Uh, it's actually uh, 10,000 square kilometer catchment. 80% of which above the 49th parallel. The 20% the is in, this, in the United States. This uh, watershed had been going through excessive uh, clear cut logging. There are six or eight logging companies, including BCTS, simultaneously logging with no, with no coordination whatsoever and with very little watershed assessment before they log. In 2018, there was a big flood event that have caused damage to 400 homes and many businesses in the down a downtown area of Grand Fork. That flood event have triggered a class action lawsuit that is still ongoing against these logging companies and the BC government represented by BCTS. The second example is Cache Creek. Cache Creek have been in the news for flooding year after year, right? But if you are having flooding in the lowland and the downstream areas and the areas that is more populated, like say Cache Creek, the town of Cache Creek, and if you're having repeated flooding, take a look at what is happening in the headwaters. The Bonaparte watershed drains into downtown Cache Creek, and that's where the flooding has been reoccurring again and again. When you take a look at the history of clear-cut logging, it's actually excessive, as the right-hand panel is showing. And then in 2017 and 2018, while fire came in to actually disseminate further the forest landscape in this watershed. This phenomena is happening in watersheds of wide range of sizes, as big as the Fraser River Basin. And you could see there the map on the left-hand side uh, of the thing of the slide is showing the extent of clear-cut logging plus a bit of fa fa fire history. And you could see in there that most of the logging has been happening in the upper 60% of the Fraser River Basin in terms of elevation, which is deemed to be the most sensitive to logging. And uh, we all remember the November 2021 flood event that was actually triggered but not caused. Triggered but not caused, let me emphasize that, by two back-to-back -back atmospheric rivers that came in to find a lot of snow at the high elevation, melted that snow, and the melt of the snow plus the sheer amount of rain that fell as a result of the atmospheric rivers ended up exacerbating the severity of the 2021 flood event. The latest estimate of the damage caused by that event is $17 billion. 
right? And that, of course, comes out of taxpayers' money. And that, of course, causes the BC government to go even more debt, as you may have heard recently in the news. We're, the province is going into debt. In my opinion, the extremes of wildfires, droughts, and floods are actually causing the government to spend more than normal, way more than normal, and therefore, that's where the taxpayers' money is going, in the damage caused by these extremes. Chimena's watershed, this is also happening not just in the interior, but on, on coastal environment. The Chimena's watershed is about 350 or 60 square kilometer on Vancouver Island. The color shows the historic cut blocks in this particular watershed. And this has also now triggered another class action lawsuit led by First Nations, the, reserve, the reserved um, landscape, the reserve area is in the lowland, right? And there are several defendants on, the, on that lawsuit, the federal government, the provincial government, the regional government, plus logging companies. This class action lawsuit was filed in January 2024. In my opinion, because of the slow, re because of how much we, we excessively logged and the slow, re slow, re slow re and the slow growth of the coniferous trees that we are planting, especially under changing climate, I think the future will be rife with these lawsuits because we're going to see more and more flooding and droughts and, and landslides. Moving from the arena of flood risk into the arena of landslide risk for practices could actually exacerbate not just the flood risk, but also drought risk and landslide risk. We just need to parse, right? How much of this risk to landslide is caused by the different drivers of the extremes? And that's what this topic, this talk is all about. The Caribou region, it's relatively subdued, flat terrain in the interior plateau. As you could see from the left-hand side panel, there's a lot of historic clear-cut logging there, some of which prior to the salvage, uh, the beetle infestation, which came in late 90s. And, uh, and another part of it, of the clear-cutting, actually exacerbated by, in the name of salvage logging of the beetle. Brenna Owen of the Canadian Press interviewed several of us. I was one of those who was interviewed for that article. Logging forest loss may have awakened ancient BC slides. So we're going to be focusing, as you could see in there, there was wildfires as well. So we have forest cover loss by wildfire, by clear cutting, by salvage logging, etc. So we have been having regional landslides problems in the entire Caribou areas. The paved roads that we travel on, uh, as you could see from that orange line, has been moving, has been sliding. The BC Ministry of Transportation have been actually actively repairing the roads that have been sliding for the last perhaps 10 years. It has been difficult for them to keep up with the landslides in the road systems. Because they some, some locations they repair in it this year, next year it will actually slide again. The railroad have actually been, been moving in the Caribou. Keep in mind now, 
that these roads that are paved, often they are running close enough to the rivers, major rivers. Keep that in mind, because that's important moving forward. Residential districts in West Qu in the Quenelle downtown in Williams Lake has been sliding since the late 90s. And you need to ask yourself, what's, what's with the late 90s, huh? Remember the last 30 years, we had excessively logged. Most of the logging has been aggressive over the last 30 years, and that coincides with the mid to late 90s. Brenna Owen in her uh, Canadian Press article, that's a quote from her, the city has recorded more than 80 centimeters of cumulative land movement there. They've got devices measuring at different locations how much the land has been moving or sliding, right? Therefore, the land has been sliding since the late 90s, almost a meter, you see that? 80 centimeters, cumulatively at every location. And the locations are shown in there by the tip of the arrow. And the length of the arrow is the measure of a centimeter of how much that particular point at the beginning of the arrow have actually slided. Another article by CBC published in 2013 titled 70 Homes Sliding Away in Quenel, BC. The same phenomena has been happening in the downtown, in the residential districts of the downtown of Williams Lake. Remember these areas, the downtown of Williams Lake and West Quenel, uh, Quenel are actually on the side of the bank of the Fraser River. Keep that in mind, that's important. Moving forward to understand what's, what's causing it. Then comes in the, the fa famous or infamous Chilcotin landslide of August 2024. It blocked the Chilcotin River for a week and created havocs and panic. And I am sure lots of money being spent to make sure they get a good handle on it. And thank goodness, the consequences at least immediate were not as dramatic as they could have been when the dam have broken after a week of water backing up and dammed kilometers upstream of the slide. Now, let's take a look at this Chilcotin River watershed, the outlet of which is here, discharging into the Fraser. So this is the Fraser, and this is the main channel Chilcotin. And the slide is right there, see? The slide is right there. This first map of the Chilcotin is showing the logging up until 1990. Before that, rushed to log, right, in the 90s. Now, the, I superimpose on it the logging up to year 2000. Then, superimpose on it cumulatively over time and cumulatively over the landscape within the watershed, the logging all the way to 2018. And as you see by now, between 2000 and 2018, there are several wildfires that have a different legend. Doesn't look clear um, from here. Now, this is the last step in the time lapse where we added the clear-cut logging from 2017 to 2023. That's how much logging has happened, plus, of course, add to it the recent wildfires that added salt to injury, right? Some of that areas that were um, burned by wildfire have, have already been logged, but some may not have been, right? So, in the week, immediately after the landslide of the Chilcotin, many of us kept a close eye on the news, and then few ventured out 
to blame the Chilkut and landslide on climate change. Some say it's climate change, depending on who you ask, right? Others would say, no, it's the wildfire that have caused it. Others would say, no, the logging practice. So when it comes to what caused what, cause effect relationship, human beings are actually very quick to rush into blaming whatever is convenient. So all of those who are quickly to blame and scapegoat a particular cause, in my opinion, they suffer from this, the rooster syndrome. <laughs> and the roosters think they, they make the sun rise. Correlation, causation, and fooling ourselves. Rooster syndrome has been endemic throughout human history. Roosters think they may make the, they make the sun rise. Renowned bio biologist Jay Gould said that the invalid assumption that correlation implies cause is a probably among the two or three most serious and common errors of human reasoning. So it's very common. You shouldn't blame the government or shouldn't blame the government for scapegoating the climate change, an industry for scapegoating perhaps wildfire, and environmental activists scapegoating logging. I don't care what caused it as long as the reasoning that we are using and the framework that we are using to decide on what caused a particular event is the right framework. And this is what this talk is all about. All right? So, the modern science of causation, which is an emerging new science, couple of decades old or young. One of the go godfathers of this in modern science of causation is Judea Pearl. He published two books. The first one is for the wider public, bestsellers, New York Times bestsellers, titled The Book of Why. Because if you're interested in knowing what caused what caused a particular event, you're answering the question of why, not the how, why. The second book that he published is written for professionals and scientists, a book this thick, full of equations and stuff about probability, titled Causality, a Google Scholar search on this book titled Causality, cited by Google scholars 25,000 times at least since 2009. That's a big number by all means. Why? Because all the sciences want to make sure that their investigation, their science investigation are causal. Because if they're not causal, then it's irrelevant. Your science is irrelevant. If the framework guiding your science is not causal, you, the outcome of your science is irrelevant. This a quote came out from Google Scholar on the book. He said, written by one of the preeminent researchers in the field, this book provides a comprehensive exposition of modern analyses of causation. It shows how causality has grown from a nebulous concept into a mathematical theory with significant application in the field of stats, artificial intelligence, economics, philosophy, cognitive science, and the health and social science. You can add hydrology to it and force hydrology for sure. I want to reflect on how the forest hydrology that have been guiding or misguiding forestry practices in the province for as long as we have been logging and in the form of clear cutting is a hydrology of convenience or voodoo science, voodoo hydrology. It's an, indefensible, it's an indefensible science because it stems out of a non-causal framework. That framework do not reveal how forest disturbances of any kind affect the frequency of these extremes, landslides, wildfire, droughts. 
right? In 2009, we published a paper titled, Horstel floods a new paradigm sheds light on age old controversies. Scientists before 2009 never agreed on the effect of logging on floods, particularly larger floods in larger watersheds. And the hydrologic forest hydrology wisdom, even in the, in the, even in the wider international forest hydrology community, that the logging of a larger watershed should not affect larger floods. That the logging over even small watersheds should not affect larger floods. And you know how they define larger floods? Events larger than the one in a 10 year, which is relatively small. One in a 10 year means that flood levels that reoccur once on average once every 10 year. That flood level, after that, forestry and forest practices and logging and the forest does not affect it. The second part of that old wisdom is that the larger the flood event, the smaller is the effect. All the way to the 10 year, then it dies off. This 2009 paper, plus another dozen published paper from my research lab, have turned the table 180 degrees on that perception. Namely, the forest can and most likely, in most situations, affect not only small, medium, but also large, the very large, and the biblical floods. And the larger the flood event, the bigger is the effect in most of the situation. We understand that logging effect on floods is a function of the cut rate, how much we're logging in a watershed, is a function of the cut block locations within the watershed, is a function of the physical characteristics of the watershed. Is your watershed relatively flat and subdued, which is super sensitive? or mountainous? Does your watershed have lakes or doesn't have lakes? Does your watershed have floodplain where that excess runoff could actually potentially be used to store that excess runoff during larger event, yes or no? What's the aspect distributions within the watershed? Some sides of the mountain face north, some sides face south, but the two sides receive more snow receive different energy, they, rec they receive different energy, they receive different amount of snow, and they melt at different times. So is the east and west. So the aspect distribution within a watershed is part of the physical characteristics. The elevation distribution and the topography of it. Some watershed are flat, some watershed have uh, mountains and mountain range. And these two physical characteristics affect the logging affects a great deal. So the logging effect on floods and landslides and droughts is dictated by not, how not only how much you log, but the spatial distribution of the cut block and also the physical characteristics of the watershed. Subdued topographies in the interior property are among the most super sensitive. Why? Because you log the trees, the, tree, the snow is not shaded by trees, they're not there. You remove the trees, the trees are not there to intercept the snow, and that snow intercepted could actually sublimate and be lost back to the atmosphere. Suddenly you have more moisture, and suddenly the energy increase available for melting in a subdued topography happens simultaneously from all the watershed, more or less because it's subdued. Had the, therefore, the subdued terrain are among the most sensitive to loss of forest cover. Whatever the cause of the loss, wildfire, salvage logging, conventional clear cutting, whatever it is. We have called in that 2009 paper to abandon the old framework that is not designed to evaluate the effect of logging on the frequency of floods and adopt uh, a, a new framework that evaluate for you both the effect on 
of logging on the frequency of these floods, but also the magnitude and simultaneously. And that could only be done through a framework we call probabilistic, and we're not going to go into geekiness and ended up losing the audience. There is foundational, philosophical, foundational, foundational difference between the two frameworks. The old deterministic and the new probabilistic. The old is not designed to tell you anything about how logging affects the magnitude, uh, the, the frequency of extremes, because it's deterministic. The only way to evaluate both and simultaneously the change in the frequency, but the change in, and the change in magnitude is to adopt the probabilistic framework. It's a framework well, well established outside forest hydrology. Even in the wider hydrology, it's well established. In climatology, in climate change science, it's very well established. In climate change science, they call it attribution science, which has been developed aggressively over the last 20 years to go after the industries that have polluted the atmosphere with CO2. Every time there is a big weather event or a big flood event, models are working to find out the extent to which this particular event, weather or hydroclimatological event, is actually caused by the polluters of the atmosphere with CO2. That is exactly the same framework that have been developing in the climate change science for over the last 20 years and aggressively that I have been with my own graduate students. Some of them are here with us quietly advancing. One would ask, why is it that we should be using this probabilistic framework as opposed to the old? The old is a flawed. Forget about it. You don't want to understand it. Why? The answer is simple. The answer lies is your answer to these three questions. Ross, do you know when the next flood is going to hit? Yes or no? No. Alex, do you know how big the next flood is going to be? No. no. Janga, do you know the spatial extent of the next flood? Why? Why? Because the drivers of the floods are randomly occurring over time. You don't know how much the snow is going to be next fall, this coming season. You don't know how the meteorology melting the snow is going to evolve over time. You, you don't know when the freshet of the hydrograph, the peak, is going to be, how fast the melt is going to be. Because all the drivers of the floods are randomly occurring over time. And if they are randomly occurring over time, the only way to evaluate the effect of logging on floods or the effect of any disturbance on floods or droughts or landslides, it use that probabilistic framework, because these extremes are driven by factors that are randomly occurring over time. So that classical Newtonian mechanics, where everything is fixed, is not causal. Make no mistake about it. So look at that river cross section that I sketched for you. Thank you, Janga. You see, when we see that the first line in there, which is, which is the, the flood level in the river getting to that particular level, if it gets there on average once every five years, we call that the five-year flood level. The second level, if that level is reached on average once every 20 years, we call that a 20-year fl uh, flood level. The return period of it is 20 years. It reoccurs on average, long-term average, uh, once every 20 years. Etc. But look, that's under undisturbed condition, right? When you disturb the landscape through urbanization, mining, logging, right, climate change, every one of these flood levels is more likely to actually be more frequent. That five-year flood level now is occurring once every year. That all the 20-year prior to disturbance flood level is now occurring once every five years. 
And that 50 year flood level is now occurring once every 20 years. Therefore, we are characterizing the flood level or the flood magnitude in cubic meter per second by a frequency. And we say that magnitude reoccurs with this frequency. That flood level reoccurs with this frequency. And the only causal inference framework there is actually the one that quantified the effect on these called the quintiles. Flood level associated with a frequency. They are called quantiles. And that's where the word quantum comes from. The same thing would apply to the groundwater table. Do you know what's actually behind all these landslides in the Caribou? Is the groundwater table elevation. Because if the groundwater table elevation, you see, the soil mantle is sitting on a bedrock. The soil mantle below us is sitting on a bedrock. Part of the part of the soil mantle is saturated with water. The upper part is unsaturated. When the snow melts or it rains, the groundwater table moves up. When it moves up, it exerts higher pressure on the soil. So as it is the case that disturbances increase the magnitude and the frequency of river flows, the disturbances could also increase the magnitude and frequency of the groundwater table elevation. So now suddenly, if your disturbances increase the amount of moisture coming into the soil, your groundwater table is now raised to higher elevation more frequently and staying at those higher elevation over longer duration. You know what that does to the soil? It weakens the soil over time. That process of weakening the soil over time as a result of soil water pressure being too high on the soil Every soil has a strength. If you exercise more water pressure on the soil that exceeds its strength, the soil will cave in. And this is how landslides happen. Especially deep-seated soil. Uh, deep-seated soil, very deep soils. And make no mistake, in my opinion, the Chilcotin is a deep-seated soil. Chilcotin landslide of August 2024. So therefore, as the river level increases in magnitude and frequency as a result of disturb uh, disturbing the land by any mean, the groundwater table elevation goes up more frequently, stays at higher elevation over longer duration. And now you need to ask yourself, what causes the water table elevation to do that? When the when the water table elevation moves up every freshet to higher level, that soil is losing some of its strength slowly but surely. That's a process called soil fatigue. Right, Spencer? It's called soil fatigue. It's called soil fatigue. And if you fatigue the soil enough, there comes a point it's no more resilient, cannot withstand the water pressure coming from on that groundwater table, and eventually it gave in. This is why in the downtown of Quenel and downtown of Williams Lake, they have been monitoring how much the land at different locations is actually moving year after year. And they found that every year the soil move, the, 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 every year there is a landslide of certain number of centimeters. So that soil is actually Losing its strength year after year, there comes a point where that's it, it actually gave in. It's critically important that, as it is the case for runoff running into a river, that runoff running into, the, into this particular river cross section downstream, that runoff comes from all the places within the watershed, including the very far headwater. Therefore, anything you do across the landscape, from the headwater all the way to the outlet, is contributing to this particular stream cross section. This is where cumulative effect of disturbances over, over the landscape, right? Did the logging happen, <laughs> right? 
cumulative effect of that logging over the landscape, the entire watershed, over the landscape, and in time, both are important to define and cause effect relationships. Est-ce que c'est clair? Same thing applies to groundwater table elevation. It's a regional response. But that regional response is a result, is a result of all everything that goes on in here. All the snow and the melt and the runoff and the rain and the disturbance of the land across the entire watershed will affect this groundwater table elevation. This is one of the reasons why we cannot identify the cause of a landslide by zooming on a particular cut block. No matter how close it is to the slide, she'll code it. Why? Because that groundwater table that have, may have moved up to cause the, the, the soil to finally cave into the chill coating, that groundwater table moved up as a result of the disturbances across the entire uh, big part in the chill coating, not just the closer clear cut. The other thing with regard to identifying the cause, focusing on a particular rain event or a particular freshet season and blaming that particular landslide on a particular rain event or a particular freshet season is a flawed causal framework. Why? Because that groundwater table elevation moves up every freshet. As it moves up, it weakens the soil, soil fatigue. And therefore, all the previous freshets or rain event may have contributed to the chill coating. And if, in my opinion, if they have a measuring device right where it happened, they could possibly and likely have seen a slow movement of that mass of waste. It just, it took, it took that last rain event that pushed it out. But that does not necessarily mean that the other events that happened in previous rain event or in previous freshet were not part of the cause. Especially when you know for a fact that clear cut logging in the way we, the loss of the forest cover, let's call it, in the way it happened in all of our landscape, Chilcot and Watershed is one of them. There is a new logging coming every year. And when the new logging coming every year, you remove the forest, you have more water infiltrating into the soil. We have more water that needs to be drained. Why? Because, bec simply because, do you know how much coniferous trees pump water out of the ground for photosynthesis and growth in that sort of caribou environment? If you receive 600 millimeter per year on average, in that kind of terrain, 50% of it is pumped back through evapotranspiration by the forest. Imagine how much the soil is relieved from the extra pore water pressure, huge. Now you, you lose the forest cover to whatever, to whatever cause, right? Logging, salvage logging, wildfire, you lost the forest cover. You have an extra 50% of moisture that need to be drained by the groundwater table and by the river system, both. Therefore, let me repeat one more time, using a, a deterministic framework that focuses on a single event to identify a cause is a flood. Using a particular cut block, no matter how close it is, is not the correct way of uh, establishing causation. Why? Because the remainder of the watershed is being nuked all over the places and disturbed. 
to wildfire, to fuel cutting, salvage logging, and every single part of the watershed contributes to that regional response in the form of a groundwater table. This is why any framework used for causation to establish cause-effect relationship to find out what, what, what the hell caused the Chilcotin landslide. You need to have a framework that integrates the entire landscape, cumulative effect. Remember cumulative effect? Cumulative effect across the whole watershed. Especially as you get closer to the, to the, to the banks of the channels. Because the groundwater table close to the bank of the channel receives all the moisture from all, all the watershed. And as far, uh, as far as the headwaters, eventually all have to come in to be drained by the channel network. And now wonder why the banks of the main river, like the Quenel and the Chilcotin and the, and the Fraser, are super sensitive to higher groundwater table. But the groundwater table near the bank is actually have to move, right? The second problem with the status quo forest hydrology that have been misguiding to a large extent forestry practice in BC for as long as we've been logging is this concept of the equivalent cut area. The equivalent cut area is a metric that we quantify two things with. We quantify the level of disturbance. We say this watershed is 30% ECA, this watershed is 40%, right? Or we're adding only 10% to the ECA, maybe there is no problem. That concept of the equivalent cut area is calculated based on knowledge of the effect of the forest at the stand level. And they sum up all the stands to get you an ECA. Well, I'm sorry. The effect of the forest is not that the effect of the forest is dictated by the landscape feature. It's not just dictated by what happened at the stand. As I told you, different topography, different aspect distribution, watersheds of different lakes, they will manifest different relationship between the forest cover or logging and the hydrology in general. So we cannot simplify the hydrologic effect into this one particular landscape metric called ECA, and that's exactly what have misguided us and continue to do so as we speak. And it's the only way they could justify clear-cut logging. The only way. And that ECA as a concept and the deterministic framework associated with it underestimate the effect of the clear-cut logging hugely, peak time. The probabilistic framework reveals that the landscape is super hypersensitive in most situations, particularly more so in the snow environment. And if you, can, if you want to ask me why, it's going to take us two more hours. The more you go downstream from the headwater to the outlet, downstream, you move downstream in larger watershed. The larger the watershed, the more super sensitive the, 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 the hydrology is to logging. Not because the cut rate is big, that too, right? But because of the nature of the probabilistic framework. Another thing about this ECA. The ECA uses a stand level hydrology or hydrologic funct functionality of the forest at the stand, but it also uses the concept of hydrologic recovery at the stand. Therefore, the hydrologic recovery of the stand used to calculate ECA is not the right hydrologic recovery. Because the only right hydrologic recovery is the hydrologic recovery of runoff in the channel. 
hydrologic recovery of snow accumulation and melt, and that's what ECA calculation is all about. At the stand, it's not surrogate of the hydrologic recovery of runoff in the channel. Why? Because it does not account for what happened to the melt or rain as it infiltrates and travels below surface and reaches the channel network. And whether you actually have lakes or don't have lakes, have flood plain or don't have flood plain, have uh, 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 mountainous or flat topography, the ECA as a concept does not account for that. It's like the biggest flaw anyone can commit in the practice of forest hydrology. I think you picked up the name of the project, Causal Power, power the power of the forest. Let me repeat and reiterate, for reasons that I have already explained well, the causal power of the forest and mitigating hydrology and geomorphology lies not at the stand, lies not at the hydrologic functionality of the forest at a stand or a single tree or a single hill slope or even a single small tiny headwater catchment. It lies at the much larger watershed scale. And the larger the watershed, the more powerful the forest cover is to mitigating your hydrology. If you wanted me to go into details, it's going to take us two more hours. You need to believe me on this. And that's all as a result of that probabilistic framework that reveal uh, an Armageddon. It reveals a super sensitive hydrology and geomorphology to disturbances in general, but the forest in, in, in particular. Causal power of the forest on hydrology increases from the tree to the stand to the hill slope to the watershed. I am telling you, the power of the forest in mitigating hydrology, oh, the forest owes its power in mitigating hydrology to the physical characteristics of the landscape. Not to what the hell happened at the stand in terms of snow accumulation and melt. Because a lot of things would happen after that melt starts moving downstream to get to the channel network. You came here wanting to learn what the heck, what in the hell caused the Chilcot and that slide. And I'm going to list for you a dozen cues that points to the cause. I'm not going to tell you what the cause is. Does it doesn't cues. You go home and do your homework. Number one. This is the first cue. Landslides are frequent over the landscape in the caribou. Frequent. They're all over the places. Frequent, and I've shown you. Downtown Quenelle, downtown, uh, right? Frequent. And the emphasis is on. Lori, the emphasis is on the word frequent, because that frequency can only come out of uh, the probabilistic framework. And if landslide is a regional problem, mon ami, mon ami, the cause can only be regional cause. So you need to find out the regional cause. And the loss of the force cover is a regional phenomenon. All right, moving on. Two. At the same location, and the city of Quenelle and the city of Williams and the regional Caribou district have been monitoring continuously for the last 20 years. The same location, they want to know how much it's moving. They have been seeing this movement appearing again and again and again at the same location every year. Every year, the same location is moving. So that the same location, that slides are repetitive. One freshet after the other. Therefore, frequent over time. And the, again, the frequency dimension. Three, the frequency of landslides have accentuated since the mid uh, dug. This is yours. Frequency of landslides have accentuated since the mid to late 90s. You need to ask yourself, what, what happened in the 90s? Many have blamed the landslides. Many has bl have blamed the landslides to the fact that the Caribou region is vulnerable to landslides. And the city of Quenelle and the city of Williams Lake are actually developed and built 
on an ancient landslide. Even if that's the case, what the hell awakened the ancient landslide? In the late 90s was a trigger. There's something that have happened in the 90s that have suddenly triggered, not only triggered, have awakened the dragon, the ancient landslides, but also it has accentuated, increased in frequency and magnitude in the, in, in the last 20 years, after the 90s. And you know from that time lapse video that I showed, we lost most of our cover over the last 30 years. Bon. Len Listen to this. Landslides are more common and more dramatic near the banks of major rivers, the Quenelle, the Chilcotin, and the Fraser. Why? Because the groundwater table elevation, which is the regional response of the landscape to snow and rain, and the way the moisture has been affected by disturbance of the land, that groundwater table near the banks is the response of the entire landscape below the ground, upstream of it, all the way to the headwater, and sometimes even from neighboring watershed. Because the groundwater table doesn't see the surface water boundary of the watershed defined based on the topography. There could be watershed leaking below the ground and you're not aware of it. Talk about cumulative effect. If the landslides are triggered by higher and more frequent groundwater table elevation, the true cause cannot be local. They cannot, you cannot blame a particular landslide on the bank to the last cut block. Because the soil has been weakened over time with the huge amount of logging that has happened over the last 30 years in the entire landscape. And sometimes even outside the Chilcotin. Because what goes below the surface in terms of drainage, right? It's not the, it's not the, it's not the topography that defines the size of the drainage for a groundwater table. It's the bedrock topography. If the landslides are triggered by higher and more frequent groundwater table elevation, the true cause cannot be local, it's regional and cumulative over landscape and over time. Over landscape because there is logging and changes over time, but over time because every freshet that groundwater is suddenly higher as a result of perhaps a higher precipitation, but perhaps loss of forest cover. And every time that groundwater moves up and stays higher uh, for a bit longer, the soil is going to lose some of its strength over time. And that has been demonstrated using the monitors in the downtown of Quenel and downtown of Williams, for the la Williams Lake, for the last 20 years. And this is why integrating the time dimension, and therefore, all the previous freshets or rain event with the landscape, because you've got things changing over the landscape over time as a result of disturbances in general. The heightened risk of landslides appears to be occurring in concert with the heightened risk of flooding. Because if you suppress if you don't have a trees to evapotranspirate from the ground, you have more runoff in the river, for sure. In Baker Creek, which is a 1,700 square kilometer watershed, the outlet of which is in Quenelle, have been in the news, have been, have been heavily logged and salvage logged since the late 90s. It has been in the news for floods every year, every other year. Therefore, you got, got a double whammy in here. You lose the forest cover. And again, I don't care how you lose it. You've got not only high highs, high, higher floods, but also higher flood risk, uh, landslide risk. And I'm hoping in a, re, in, a, in, a, in a soon to come presentation, I will actually bring a new research that shows that the forest, the loss of the forest cover, and replanting the coniferous in the cut block exacerbate droughts.
but that's another story for another day. The loss of the forest cover, whether on coast or in the interior, our new research have now shown that replanting the trees and younger trees consume way more uh, groundwater than the older trees that were logged, and that actually exacerbates the droughts. This has been demonstrated by colleagues, not from my lab, but even at OSU for the coastal environment. But the logging practices could exacerbate the droughts because of forest roads. Because the forest road network intercepts subsurface flow, change it into surface runoff into the ditches, into the culvert, and the culvert into the gullies, and out to the ocean quickly, especially for coastal watersheds. Do you know what other mechanisms associated with logging practice that could potentially exacerbate the droughts? is the melted drift in the snow transient environment on the coast. On the coast, on the coast, this mid elevation zone where the snow falls in the form of wet snow and the temperature hovers around zero, that wet snow is ready to melt. It's intercepted by the canopy, the old canopy is ready to melt. And when it melts, it falls in the form of melted drip and it recharges the groundwater and as long as the wet snow is falling from mid-October all the way to end of March. And that melted drip over those six months is very valuable for making sure we've got enough low flows during the dry, during y all year around, especially for coastal streams that have fish in them. And I can assure to you that these intricacies can only be revealed by the right causal framework. Seven, the listen to this, I, because I, I, I have seen a consulting reports that have blamed the landslides in the Caribou on precipitation, on climate change. When in fact, the wider literature in hydrology and climatology established that Western North America is receiving less precipitation over time and not more as a result of global warming, at least in the form of snow. That hints to potentially climate change, increasing precipitation is ruled out. Most landslides happen in the spring. Guess what? Most of the landslides happen in the spring. Therefore, it's related to snow. And the snow plays a big role in the recharge of the groundwater table. And the recharge of groundwater table through the melt of the snow from the outlet all the way to the ridges raises the groundwater table and increases that water pressure on the soil. One year after the other, one freshet on the other until that soil is ready to go. But you cannot blame it when it goes to just the last, the last freshet, no. That's a deterministic framework to cause effect relation and it's not defensible. Nine, nine, lost forest cover in the Caribou, and I said this before, used to relieve the ground from excess soil moisture via evapotranspiration at a minimum 50% of the total precip, at a minimum. And this is dry snow environment where the, where, where the mean annual precipitation, I don't know, it's low. In the Caribou, it's low. What, 600? What, huh? anybody? Any guess? It's low. 50% of it would have lost if you had the old forest. Conclusions. The, the forest hydrology framework that have guided forestry and forestry practice in BC for decades need a complete rehaul, complete redesign. Both watershed assessment procedures and cumulative study frameworks in BC are outright outdated and an urgent need to, for a complete rehaul because they are not scientifically defensible, period. And this is why, why I'm calling them voodoo hydrology and hydrology of convenience because that's the only way you can justify what you're doing. And as a consequence, they substantially underestimate the risk to hydrology and geomorphology. There is hope in the horizon. Where is uh, Jennifer? Okay. 
Jennifer, there is hope. There is hope in the horizon. The Forest Practices Board, as you know, had just finished an investigation on the logging that happened in the Kettle River Basin. The first example that I've shown you in the slide, the Grand Fork 2018 flood event. A member of the public, he happens to be an RPF, went and complained to the Forest Practices Board that the logging is doing harm, that the logging is excessive, that the government and the industry are not doing watershed assessment, that the cumulative effect studies were not done when the decision was made to do the logging. And guess what? The Forest Practices Board was very critical of the way the logging practice had been conducted in the Kettle River for the last couple of decades. He came hard on professionals and the government for not paying attention to watershed and watershed values and the water values and stuff. As a matter of fact, when I read that report, the Forest Practices Board is now using the same language that I have used before in the last couple of years. Namely, I have I've been using excessive clear-cut logging. I have been using clear-cut logging and excessive clear-cut logging. I have been critical of the watershed assessment framework. I have been critical of the lack of reinventing and redesigning the uh, cumulative watershed study. And that's exactly what the Forest Practices Board is saying. This is why I'm saying there is hope in the horizon. And guess what? Another, another beak of hope. The, the professional magazine called Innovation of the Professional Association of Engineers and Geoscientists in BC just released their fall issue of their innovation magazine. And they featured the three-page report on the work that I do, being critical of the way the risk to floods in particular have been evaluated in this province. And the title of that three-page article is Mitigating Flood Damage in High-Risk Areas, Deterministic versus Probabilistic Methods, Climate Change Effects on Forest, coupled with the impact of logging heightens the risk and intensity of flood damage in areas prone to flooding. Two BC experts discuss approach, approaching mitigation through deterministic and probabilistic methods. So there were two of us interviewed for that particular, two of us were interviewed for that particular thing, right? So um, I want to thank the lead of the Power of Forest project, Jennifer, for actually inviting me. I want to thank you for showing up to my talk today, those who are online and those who are in person. I want to acknowledge the contributions of all of my graduate students and postdocs that have worked with me over the last 30 years, and some of them are still around. And um, yeah, thank you very much again. <laughs>